Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to join me. I hope that uh, I'm coming through uh, loud and clear. I'm sorry that I couldn't join you today uh, in Tallinn uh, due to uh, quite unforeseen events. Uh, I had to cancel my participation. So I'm extremely happy to be able to join you from uh, a distance uh, virtually today. And uh, thank you so much to the organizers for having invited me to share some ideas about how to communicate science in uh, times of uh, crisis and emergency, uh, also drawing upon alternative methods of uh, science communication and targeting different audiences. What I will do now is just to share uh, some slides and uh, then we will be going forward. Thank you. So um, I'm a professor myself of uh, science communication uh, at Aalborg University in, uh, in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, and I also happen to be the chair of a European cost action on science communication that is right now uh, writing up its final conclusions and uh, trying to sort of uh, figure out what is uh, the research agenda for science communication in Europe these days. Uh, trying to develop uh, new uh, indicators of impact and also developing recommendations for how to integrate science communication um, more thorough in uh, the European funding programs and around European universities so that we are thinking uh, about integrating science communication much more upstream than has normally been done. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, we, this is the group of, uh, of experts that I'm so lucky to, uh, to, to chair and it's a privilege to be working with representing more than uh, 42 different organizations from around Europe. Uh, we put out earlier this year, we put out a report on how to communicate science in times of COVID-19. So rather than publishing uh, a book chapter or uh, publishing a special issue, we chose to put out a report um, in sort of the belief that this would uh, reach a broader audience, including policymakers. So policymakers obviously have taken a large interest in science communication throughout the pandemic, trying to figure out, as it were, how to effectively communicate research expertise, data and evidence um, to decision makers in government and also secondarily to citizens in society that have to uh, have access to high quality um, science uh, communication in order to make up their minds uh, on how to comply to government rules, uh, vaccination programs, uh, and also, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, listen to uh, public uh, messages. And as many of you will know, this has been done with uh, different types of success in different countries. Uh, and I, I believe it's, it's way too early uh, by now to, uh, to evaluate uh, the success or failures of any given uh, policy system. But one thing that we can conclude for sure uh, is that uh, science communication has taken the center stage uh, of policy making within uh, the um, European uh, framework. So some of the work we have been doing has been to sort of figure out uh, how to include um, interdisciplinary research more urgently than ever and how to really uh, integrate um, science communicators within research projects and also within uh, the government science advice uh, system. Uh, as we say in the report, and I also wanted to sort of make that statement today in, in front of you, uh, COVID-19 has been as much a communication emergency as a health crisis. Um, a multi-dimensional challenge uh, such as the current one really requires that we work across disciplines, but also across different sectors in society, making new partnerships and new alliances, uh, communicating much more intimately uh, between universities, government uh, policymakers, and also media at large. So these are some of the issues we are addressing and trying to come up with recommendations and guidelines in the report. It also turns out that some of these more, let's say, uh, soft indicators, uh, such as trust, behavioral compliance, vaccine acceptancy, it really does indeed require a citizen-centric uh, sort of communication. So it is not enough that we are only communicating, let's say, the hard facts. We also need to communicate uh, the ethical dimension, the policy dimension, the cultural dimension, even uh, understanding how different communities are responding differently to different types of information. So here we see a major task uh, in terms of the social sciences, even the humanities, 
who have become an integrated part uh, of the scientific advisory system coming up with more effectively communication strategies. At least that's our recommendation. And we have also seen, for example, in the Netherlands, uh, in Norway, in Denmark, in other countries that this has been done um, to some success. But I guess some uh, work really still needs to be done. There can be much more integration of interdisciplinary communication of science throughout a pandemic as the current one. Um, we are not the only ones saying that. Actually, principles for trusted and actionable knowledge all make a call for better and more um, structured science communication that is based upon principles of engaging the public, uh, communicating science to a broader audience, and also, as it were, listening uh, to an audience and including different voices, different disciplines, and different organizations in civil society. So we are not the only one, but we have been trying to sort of reach out and see how can we direct and design some principles for advice uh, to also be integrated within the wider, let's say, science advisory system. So that is science communication, in short, uh, for policymakers. Well, at the same time, and I guess we have to acknowledge that, um, outside our expert institutions, uh, trust in authorities is, yes, let's say it, perhaps not in crisis, but it is being challenged. Uh, we see that uh, increasingly uh, both mass media, but um, in particular social media, are accelerating polarization in society and that it becomes increasingly hard and difficult uh, for ordinary citizens really to distinguish between facts and, uh, and, uh, and fake information. It has become a sort of battlefield, a battleground uh, for political struggles where uh, certain policymakers and politicians even are speculating in circulating misinformation that is supporting their cause. Uh, obviously being accelerated by social media platforms uh, and algorithms. We also have people moving to the streets. Uh, this has been seen in uh, countries uh, such as the picture here shown in the slides in France, but also in Denmark. Uh, you know, Denmark in Copenhagen, it's one of the most socially coherent countries, but we also have struggles in the street. We have mass demonstrations. We now have for the first time uh, seen in, in our country, we have now a movement of anti-vaxxers, uh, anti-vaccine uh, and uh, vaccine hesitants, uh, uh, taking the struggle to the streets, demonstrating, calling out politicians, and as it were, signaling a basic uh, distrust, um, not so much in scientists, but at least in authorities. And it's not the only case, unfortunately. These are some of the other cases we are working on in my research team. There are still, even today, where we have a new study out uh, only two weeks uh, ago showing that 99% of the scientific consensus in peer-reviewed literature supports uh, documentation of humanly induced climate change. But it is still difficult for our politicians to really act upon that knowledge. And there are other controversies, public controversies, even over, let's say, trusted knowledge. So who are the experts to be trusted? How do we assess the trustworthiness of science communication, really, I guess, uh, but now, uh, you know, I might be a bit biased here coming from a background in science communication, but I think these issues are really at the heart of our society currently. Think about uh, H uh, HPV virus, uh, e-cigarettes, uh, all, all the work that has been done on harm reduction. These are still very much uh, controversial issues of scientific communication. And there are reasons for that. And we are starting to unlock some of those reasons within the behavioral sciences, within behavioral and cognitive psychology. We can see how um, expert testimony uh, to a wider audience often becomes subjected to what we call motivated reasoning. So these are some of the cognitive biases operating both within our own cognitive system, but also being accelerated by policy ma makers, by media, by social media, at least to some extent, such as selective information, uh, cultural cognition, um, Dunning-Kruger effects, um, motivated and confirmation bias, basically the fact that often the media uh, consumer is looking for more information to support 
his or her worldview rather than confronting him or herself with competing hypotheses, with knowledge that might be uncomfortable in any given situation, but still has a high degree of validity. So we have to understand that not only scientific facts, not only scientific evidence will actually make an impact in a society. There is a profound need, and this is the basic take home message of this talk this morning. There is a profound need to connect evidence, high quality peer reviewed scientific research with trust, with values and with sense making. It should be unpackaged, unlocked and explained in a dialogical fashion in which people are also able to ask questions, even critical questions, uncomfortable questions, so that we together can include more citizens, including policymakers uh, and democratic uh, governments within one sort of narrative that are able also to include uh, competing uh, values, competing voices. So I think that is one of my major uh, sort of uh, conclusions uh, for today. It's a paradox. And uh, as many of you will know, and I guess this talk in and of itself, only the last 10 minutes of this talk is a paradox because uh, whereas we see at uh, one hand, science communication taking center stage in policymaking and in our response capacity towards these emergencies, such as climate change, such as pandemic responses. At the other hand, it is also being challenged. But really, I do believe, and now I said it a couple of times, that the need for trusted and also what I hear called actionable knowledge, that is knowledge that can be put in to science advice, has at the same time never been greater. So we shouldn't let us be overwhelmed by the fact that mis or disinformation are circulating or that polarization is happening. We should be tackling it. We should be taking this as an opportunity to stress the importance of science communication for the benefit of society and democracy. I already gave you the uh, example of COVID-19. I think COVID-19 has, no matter where we are standing right now in the pandemic, our response capacity would really have been uh, without any impact at all had it not been because of the availability of science communication, including science communication managers at universities, in the media landscape, and also the availability of competences, all the workshops, all the conferences like the one you have hosting today in Tallinn is also contributing to response capacity. And we have to remember that and also tell our dear colleagues within the funding system, such as the Research Council, that science communication really needs to be taken on board in the same research programs that are trying to solve some of these grand challenges. Confronting society, global climate change, the green transition, I hope that we can learn from COVID-19 and start exploring and also exploiting some of the same tools that turned out to be effective in the pandemic to really now solve some of the hard issues in the green transition. What are some of the strategies? Um, so let's try to explore some of the nuts and bolts here. How, what can we do really to then get knowledge across to policymakers and to democratic um, uh, audiences uh, in our society? I think one of the toolboxes we are working with um, today in Denmark, in Copenhagen, and also with the European Commission is what we call knowledge brokering. So communicating research to society becomes this re key resource when we are addressing uh, some of these key challenges. Uh, at the same time, scientists uh, from all di disciplines, as a matter of fact, becomes an integrated uh, part of shaping public conversations and even to some extent, I hope at least also public decision making. So here it's important really to start figuring out what are some of the principles governing the role of scientists and science communicators uh, in society. So Roger Pilke, a colleague of ours in the US, suggested that we needed to look upon science communicators as at least attaining the ideal of the honest broker and try, trying to avoid as far as possible to become seen as or perceived as a political stakeholder, what Roger calls an issue advocate. That is somebody with a cause somebody with a political agenda. So we should try as far as we can, and we can never do this perfectly, to disentangle and take apart our political engagement from our scientific communication. 
Uh, that being said, obviously, science is also entangled with values, ideologies, moral statements, but uh, we can do more to govern the communication of science. For example, and this is one of the topics we are working at uh, with cost, to come up with better and more uh, coherent terms of references, uh, how to protect scientists when they go onto the media landscape, code of conduct, which should be mutually binding. So it's not only rules for scientists, but it's also rules and principles for universities and for governments on how for them to protect the voice of science in society, especially <clears throat> in these turbulent times where scientists who are stepping into the public arena might be the subject of harassment uh, and different types of campaigns. So these references are important to bootstrap or secure the role of the scientist as an honest uh, broker. We are trying to develop different models for how to uh, understand what are the different dynamics of, uh, on the one hand, obviously policy making, and on the other hand, um, research and knowledge production. And as many of you in this room today will know, this is not the same thing. It should not be, it cannot be. But what we can do and what we can do even better, I think, than we have been able to do up until now is to make new spaces for collaboration, for co-creation, and also for communication, where it is possible for members of different audiences from the research community, from the policy community, from civil society, from media, from non-governmental institutes, and also from uh, industries to really get together, to seek information, to engage each other, to share knowledge. We know that actually as a means of communicating science, especially in turbulent times, sharing knowledge early on is really a key uh, for different stakeholders to be able not only to be informed and discuss research, but also to use it for practical policy making, decision making. So we need to find new spaces where people can actually meet, challenge each other and become informed about each other's uh, knowledge. And this is not a classical, let's say, linear transmission of research from a journal article or a university department to uh, society. It's a much more entangled, uh, non-linear, circular even process. And we as science communicators need to put ourselves on the map and be able to facilitate processes like these. We're doing it, uh, I'm currently uh, running a project as a knowledge broker um, on algorithms, data and democracy in Denmark. And we are now exploring these new uh, platforms for science communication. These pictures are taken two weeks ago in Copenhagen, where we held a so-called policy lab. So that's a concrete laboratory where we actually let uh, researchers meet with policymakers and decision makers and let them work on common problems, on common solutions. So here we are not talking about science communication in the traditional sense of standing up on a stage or giving an interview or even writing a tweet. Here we're talking about science communication as a means of conversation. So we should really be talking about science conversation rather than only communicating science to different audiences. And it works. We can see how people become engaged and we can see how different audiences respond to the research advice in a much more intimately way and in a way that connects better to their own practical reality. So these are just some ideas I wanted to mention. So let me wrap up the talk by saying, at least from this um, morning's perspective and now uh, hopefully soon coming out of the pandemic, you have to keep in mind communicating research and moving forward there are three different dimensions or three different issues, at least that I believe is important. And one is obviously to know what you know yourself, to be confident about your own knowledge, to be standing on the back of peer reviewed high quality research is of course the golden standard of all science communication and science advice. But you also at the same time have, you have to make the effort to understand what can the stakeholder understand and know from what you know. So this is of course not the same. What you know and what the stakeholder can know is only small part of the same uh, pool of knowledge. 
and you have to find a preferred mechanisms. How do you get your research, your evidence, your data, your advice across, for example, uh, by means of science communication? And then what is even more crucial, um, and I'm going to end there in, in, in two minutes, is also you need to understand uh, what is actually the knowledge required to solve a common problem. What we know really works is if you're able to set up a joint problem space, so you bring your knowledge into the knowledge of the stakeholder, the, the audience, the um, decision maker, the, the patient organization, the everyday life of citizens, but you start understanding what is required for you and the stakeholder to solve a specific problem together. This is really where science communication becomes crucial and where it can have a major impact in society. So I'm at least thinking these days a lot about communicating science as a way of joint problem solving. You need to be solving a problem. At least that's when research tends to have a larger impact. So here is just to end with some principles that we worked out and you will be able to look into more detail perhaps in, in some of the publications. Provide the information in an accessible format is of course extremely crucial. Use clear and also shareable content. For our colleagues in science, this is, um, this is second to none. Also reference trustworthy and independent resources. We have to make sure that we are standing on the shoulder of honest knowledge production to the extent it's possible. And also being open and honest about possible uncertainties, complexities within the knowledge base. Um, if there is scientific consensus, we should underline it. If there is not in our communication, we should accept it. Um, it is how science evolves, including also uh, acknowledging uh, different uncertainties. And then create this more authentic, humble advice where we work together to solve um, common problems, um, actually bringing people into a science conversation than only communicating research top down. Build data and evidence into narratives. I hope I already mentioned that. And then um, I guess more facts won't work in and of themselves. Unfortunately, even as a research scientist myself, I'm, um, I'm sorry to say, but more facts, more evidence, more data will not work in and of itself. It needs translation. It needs context. And there is a need for a certain extent of sense making to unpackage, to unlock science for the greater benefit of society still is very important. So the facts really do not speak for themselves. There is a lot of work in front of us, but I also think that we came a long way and uh, that science communication really uh, is in the moment right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Beresen, uh, for your great presentation. But there are some questions, some uh, you already answered, but uh, what do you think were the most important factors that have contributed to the high vaccination rate of Denmark? What did you do right? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, actually, I do believe that a, lot, that a lot of the cause for the high vaccination uptake has been due to the fact that we have been listening to uh, social scientists. So we have been including in our scientific advisory mechanism in Denmark, actually behavioral science. And what the government took from that advice was we need to direct much more citizen centric communication. So we need to be much better at understanding what does the everyday life of the normal citizen look like and how can we interact with the citizen in a way that allows for trust and relationships to be built rather than only, you know, uh, blaming citizens or calling out uh, anti-vaxxers or um, sort of taking a more authoritarian route. So I think, I mean, obviously uh, the fact that we are now going through a third wave of Corona in Denmark means that we still have 20% of the population, which is not vaccinated, but we are up in that uh, domain of more than 80% having uh, accepted the, vac the, the vaccine. And what we can see from some of the data is that there is just simply a very high level of trust in government. Uh, throughout the pandemic. There was high level of trust before the pandemic. As I said before, Denmark is a quite coherent society, but it has been even more accelerated. And I think this is actually due to the fact that we have started listening to, let's say it as it is, uh, science communication and the behavioral psychology behind it. 
Okay, thank you. There is one uh, more question, uh, which uh, a bit uh, you already told uh, us, but uh, if the crisis communication has l lacked so far and the trust of the society is broken, how to salvage the situation if it can be done? How to come back? Yes, so I, I, I hope that <laughs> at least so some of the observations in my presentation is, is also addressing that question, that we need to start building report and we need to build relationships. It is really about sense making and building more in, and, and, and you know building more inclusive narratives. Um, of course, as we know also from other opinion polls, and this has been proven in different studies, that uh, often the role of scientists and the level of trust in science in society is often very dependent on the general level of trust in government. So in the eye of the uh, citizen, often scientists becomes very closely associated to governments. And I guess you cannot blame anyone for that because we are often paid by the state and appointed in a state system. But we also need to retain our independence. So one of the major drivers of trust and one of the major drivers of um, building uh, trustworthy advice uh, in the eyes and in the perception of, of citizens is independence. It's of course transparency, even I would say radical transparency. So I think we should not take trust for given uh, and we should not just uh, accept that trust is declining. We have actually a scientist to start working on building relationships and opening up our research, sharing our content, sharing our knowledge. And of course, this will not fix all our, you know, uh, challenges in society, but it will probably help with uh, retaining a strong voice of science, even if we are confronted with a period in our civilization and in our democracy where trust is unfortunately declining in many corners. So not a very specific answer, but I think we can start, we can start a process in which we are being more humble and taking the view of the citizen si simply more seriously. All right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Peresen.